Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello, and welcome back to The Blockchain Show. Our guest today is the CEO of Minds.com, the decentralized social network. Bill, I think that you are in tie for being on the show the most with Eric Voorhees. So thank you, man, and, and welcome back to the show. Nice. Great to be here, dude. Man, I heard you on the Joe Rogan experience, and I got to give you some some props, man. That was impressive. You you really held your own for like two and a half hours. Appreciate that. You know, I kind of wanted to talk about where we're going afterwards, because Joe, Joe was an incredible interviewer, and there's no way that I can really, you know, I'm not going to try to emulate him, but I was hoping maybe we could expand on some of those topics where, you know, maybe he wasn't quite quite so versed on like blockchain and kind of alternatives really man yeah for sure i mean you know and you introduced us as as decentralized social network which you know i think is is a generous title i i I sort of consider us on that path i I can't say that we're fully decentralized yet obviously that's where we want to go we're sort of partially we we just started working on a a new extension app called Nomad, which is the code's all on GitLab. It's at uh, gitlab.com slash mind slash nomad and slash nomad underscore or nomad dash mobile. And so it essentially uses the Ethereum address from the mind's wallet as like the username and then uses React native and node. And that interfaces with either IPFS or DAT. We're going to play with two different versions of it to see what what works the best. And for anyone who doesn't know, those are like more sort of torrent style decentralized networks, not blockchain based. And so we're pushing our R&D in that direction. But Minds.com, obviously we use Ethereum for our our token ecosystem and our peer-to-peer payments and whatnot. But we're not like fully decentralized on Minds.com from an architectural perspective yet. I mean, we use Cassandra and Angular and we we have servers, you know, in order to be able to grow to a degree that can even handle significant growth and provide user experience that's acceptable and usable, we kind of have to be dabbling in both worlds. So just to clarify that a little bit, because I don't want to be claiming things that, you know, we're not fully there yet. Yeah. And I should be careful because sometimes I get carried away thinking that blockchain is the solution for everything. And, you know, the two years, two and a half years we've been doing this show, I've kind of seen a change in the trend as more of a uh, panacea into more of a, you know, it's just getting dominated by business. And I don't know, maybe the narrative is changing because everything I see is largely based on social media posts and what I read on the internet. But, you know, I really appreciated what you were were saying earlier. Well, I guess this would have been when you're talking to Joe Rogan about, you know, how blockchains aren't really, they can't solve everything. They're going to be a, an incredible tool, but, you know, like you said, they're slow. They are, um, you know, kind of clunky right now. We're just, we're, and I'm trying to envision a world of, you know, decentralized internet and how decentralized should we go? Yeah, that's a that's a whole other other question. I th- I think we want the ability to have a a fully decentralized app experience that is competitive with you know a YouTube or or a Facebook type thing. So we're going to push it and you know there's going to be blockchains that come out that are that are much much faster and we need to think as a society about what that means to have a fully decentralized social network and, you know, to have everything that we're doing stored publicly forever. And obviously you can do permissioned based stuff and, and, you know, so that people are only accessing what, you know, their permission to access and it's, you know, fully encrypted and whatnot. I, I think that that, that is where we're moving but it's a very different world like when you can't delete things so 
that's something we need to juggle. And I think that providing people with the options, basically, to treat their data how they want to treat it is ultimately what is going to work the best. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm really excited where you guys are going. And, and it's really encouraging how your momentum just seems to continue. I did have something else that I remember when Alex Jones got kicked off of pretty much everything. There was a couple weeks where I just, you know, he was still in my mind, but I was like, man, that dude, he must have really, you know, messed up. Or, and then I realized, I don't know why. I was like, why? Why can't I see him anymore? And then I just happened to go on Minds and there, there he was. I, I went on Twitter only to find that I had been suspended for quite a few years. I don't really use it, but we live in such a bizarre time right now where it's like, you know, I don't know how to get my Twitter back. It's not, it doesn't, it's not worthwhile to me, but I'd like to know what my friends were trying to, trying to ask me. I'd like to know, I'd like to be a part of the conversation. You know, I, I like, that's what I like so much about minds is that, you know, if it's legal, it's there. It's not about, there's not some strange moral authority that nobody elected to make these decisions. And I'm sorry to be long-winded here, but you brought up something that you guys were thinking about, which was like a, uh, like a jury type. Yeah, we're actually rolling out. We're rolling that out uh, the end of this month, which is basically a jury system for deciding on how reports should be treated. Like, say, someone reports something that they think should be marked NSFW, or they report something they think should be taken down, or you know, there's an appeal on a decision. We're going to be implementing juries of like initially to start like 12 random users to vote on how they think outcomes should should take place based on our terms. And the terms also we, we published on GitLab uh, under our policy section. So people can fork our terms and, you know, recommend changes if they think that there's things wrong with our terms. But I mean, generally, you, you spoke to the terms before, as long as it's lawful in the U.S., um, you know, it's generally okay as long as they're not like, you know, maliciously spamming the platform and like those, those types of things. But, you know, this is really important because I don't, I don't want to be in that position. No one, neither does anyone on our team. We, we don't want to be these gatekeepers to what is and is not acceptable. Now, there's probably going to be some bumps we run into along the way with the jury system and people trying to manipulate it. So we're going to ease into it. You know, the whole, I don't know if you saw the follow-up interview that Joe did with Tim Poole and Dorsey and Via. I forget. Uh, I think that's who pronounced her name from Twitter. Did you see that? No, I just seen Tim and and Jack by themselves. I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, that one is is very interesting because basically, you know, Tim is very versed in all the specifics and nuances of all of the different bannings, and they literally tried to respond. They probably said twenty times, "Oh, you know, we make mistakes and whatnot." But they they stood behind their decisions to yeah ban Alex and ban you know all of these other random suspensions that happened like you know around offensive you know offensive statements that you know to what Tim's point was you know for instance on the topic of misgendering it's in Twitter's terms not to misgender and Tim's point was well you realize half of the population of the U S doesn't even think that that is a biologically legitimate thing to say. Now I don't, I'm not even trying to get involved in that debate. I, you know, am personally fine with calling people by whatever pronoun they want, as long as they're a nice person to me. And, and Tim, Tim thinks that too, but the issue is that it's in something that half the population disagrees with is in Twitter's terms. Therefore, making it undeniable that Twitter's terms are politically biased. It, that, that, that's just one example. And so what troubled me is that they don't seem to be making any movement in regards to actually changing the terms or, you know, they talk about roads to redemption for people who have been banned to get back on. And, you know, they seem to sort of say, oh, you know, yeah, maybe that's something that we could look at in the distant future. But, you know, it should really be a, a very simple thing. Like all these users are often, you know, really well-known public figures who are obviously not malicious. You know, it should just be like, let them back on. Like, what do you, why is this so just plagued with bureaucracy? And 
I don't know. T- Tim was very pessimistic about it. He even said it on the podcast that, you know, he doesn't see change happening. And, you know, Jack is, I, maybe he's trying to do the right thing. You, you know, we don't know the politics behind the scenes, if he even has any power at all. You know, he's doing the whole run of podcasts. He's going on Gad Sad and Sam Harris and Joe, and he's doing all these like sort of interesting podcasts or podcasts with interesting people, sort of just giving talking points to them, not actually talking about tangible change. So it's just a, it's a strange situation. I don't think we, we really know what's going on, what's involved with getting meaningful change implemented into these, these huge platforms. You know, you also see Zuckerberg uh, talking about privacy now, talking about blockchains. It's like the trendy thing to do now from the mainstream social networks, but we're not likely going to see them implement anything that is truly in the spirit of Bitcoin and blockchain, which would mean that their whole platforms would have to be open sourced and they would have to be actually fair systems. So, you know, my point was that, okay, it's good. These people are talking about it. I'll certainly give them credit for that. It's better than them not talking about it, but it just feels very half-hearted. Yeah, man. I, I totally get that feeling too. It's like lip service. It's like they're trying to appease people, but I think really they're compromised. A lot of people like Jack Dorsey and bigger corporations, they, it's all about money, you know? And unfortunately, like you said, we have no idea the full extent of what's going on with closed source uh, software. Um, It's freaky stuff, man. I remember thinking Instagram was really cool and then finding out it was owned by Facebook. Is there a mechanism that you guys have in place at Minds to kind of prevent a similar takeover to what's happened to Instagram and WhatsApp and, you know, other, what I consider, you know, apps that were designed just to, to help people with good integrity. You know, the interesting thing about WhatsApp and Instagram is though, you know, even though I am sure that the founders had good intentions, they weren't, they, they were never open source. So there was always a certain motive there. They were never fully about, you know, giving the platform, you know, to, to the world. I think that we saw the founders leave of Instagram and WhatsApp and Oculus. I mean, Brian Acton invested like 50 million in Signal. He's the WhatsApp founder. And, you know, he said, you know, point blank, I betrayed all of those users and, you know, I don't know how I'm going to make it up to them. But you know, that was the problem from the start that they were never open source. And I think that's our edge is that anyone can, is encouraged to take our code and build their own network. They can do it. We're, we've, we've given the blueprints away. So, you know, that's number one, how we protect against it. You know, we're not just pushing all of our resources into something that's locked away from the world. And then, you know, additionally, in terms of like governance and whatnot, I mean, it's just not, you're, you're never going to be able to safeguard fully against, you know, in any company. I think that there, there are, you know, we have a board in place that is obsessed with these issues, basically. Um, we have 1,500 community owners who have stock in the company who invested in our original equity crowdfunding round who are going to be holding us to the fire. We're trying to hold ourselves to the fire. It would make no logical sense for us to do anything other than that because everyone would probably just leave. (laughs) That's the best way that I can answer it and continually try to engineer the power out of our own hands which is what things like this jury system and decentralizing the app itself do so that actually we're not even controlling the network itself. I really like that. I wish that we had more politicians that had that same kind of, I think you even said that on Joe Rogan, you know, politicians who would enact policies that would kind of put themselves out of the need for being around. Yeah. Well, think, think about how ridiculous it is that, 
you know, with all the trillions of dollars that we're spending, that we don't even have pervasive mainstream, you know, encrypted voting online. You know, I'm not even saying using it as a primary metric, but we should we should at least have it as like a secondary metric to see what the whole country thinks about different issues. You know, the government is so inept at developing good technology. It's just, it's really unbelievable. And because, you know, the technology exists, you know, the, one of the things that the white house did, I think under Obama, which was the only cool piece of software I've ever seen them put out was the whitehouse.gov petition software. So anyone could put a petition. If it gets a hundred thousand signatures, then the white house will respond to it. That was an easy project. Why wouldn't the government be developing amazing modern apps for the whole country to be voting on stuff real time? I mean, it's, it's just really unacceptable that it's not being done. Um, but I also just wanted to touch on a point you said about how scary it is with, with these, uh, these bannings. And I, I do, I agree with you. It's, it, it's, yeah, I always think of that or- Orwell quote that's, you know, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. And it's like, when you are in control of the information flow, you are literally molding the consciousness of the world and people in the future's perception of what history actually was. So when, you know, when you ban people, you're basically hiding them from the public record of history. You know, it doesn't mean, you know, there's, there's other places on the, on the internet to publish and whatnot, but if, if they're being so, they're literally molding history and the world's perception of, of what is even actually going on in the world and, and what is true. You know, the fact that they're banning people like the people that they're banning and like comedians and that is so far over the line of what is acceptable that, you know, we just, we, we can't be relying on them to be good stewards of literally the historical record of the planet earth. You know, that I, I think it's helpful for people to, to think about it like that. Like the, the, the networks that you support and that you use, think of that as a record that future generations will be referring to. And that's why sites like archive.org are so cool. Totally open source, trying to create like an authentic record of the history of the internet with the Wayback machine and whatnot. You know, that, that's where th- those types of projects and, you know, Wikipedia has its own issues, but these are the types of projects where we need to be putting our energy, not in these companies who've already betrayed everybody and saying that, oh, you know, we're going to start looking at blockchain now or, oh, we're going to start, you know, talking about privacy now. It's just, I don't feel they deserve our energy anymore. Yeah, man. It's like, it's our humanity. You know, it's a public consciousness. Basically, all of mankind's knowledge. We live in the information age, but sometimes I wonder if we live in the the disinformation age. You're talking about the flow of information and who controls the narrative. You know, we hear so many times in history about newspapers lying to the public and people lie, people deceive. Pe- some people are malicious. Not everybody is, but think about, you know, people are so plugged into their phones and sometimes it's the first thing they do in the morning and it can literally depress people. It can and I, and I, you know, I don't necessarily have that fear of missing out, but I want to be able to connect to my people just like anyone else. No, I completely agree with you. It is, it is our humanity that's on the line. You know, disinformation is always going to exist. Um, misinformation, you're going to, you know, sometimes people are just wrong. Sometimes people are maliciously putting it out. Sometimes people have false beliefs. And they're sharing that information. And I I think I mentioned this too, but, you know, we have to do as much as we can to help educate people on how to, how to research, how to understand peer review. 
how to you know discern reality for themselves but banning false information you know i think maybe in certain circumstances when it's like you know clearly illegal which is rare um okay fine but we need wider we need we need to open up the lens you know we need to increase the aperture of our of our information flow so that we can have the full spectrum of information in order to be able to make educated decisions. So ultimately that is what is going to give us the, the ability to make an educated decision. If, 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 if you're hiding half the content, then you you can't make an educated decision about w- what what is actually true. So there are problems associated with that that we have to tackle. But I but you know banning it is just not is just not the way. It's it's it it doesn't go away. It makes the problem on the internet much worse. Luckily, with all the momentum of of Bitcoin and and crypto and all the privacy focused apps and just the internet freedom movement in general, you know, I'm really not worried. It's just going to take time. We because we just have to keep building and we have to keep becoming more in, uh, more independent, more competitive. But the network effects are, are going to start happening more and more. It's already happening. We're seeing. We're, you know, it's happening. So we just have to be, I think, patient and keep working hard. And eventually we're going to catch up to them. It's just, I, I don't, I don't think the internet is such a dystopia yet to the point where we don't have that opportunity. Right. Yeah. There's still, there's still time. And I, I really encourage everybody listening to go to minds.com. I'm going to put a link in the show notes where you can follow Bill. Uh, we also have the blockchain show, you know, even, even podcasting, there's parallels that I see here about just supporting creators, creating content. I mean, you guys are talking about content creators suffering and, you know, these people spend so much time working on the, like whether podcasts or, or, you know, YouTube video type shows and only just to, to reach a fraction of the people they used to reach is, is incredibly discouraging. It was really interesting when you guys were talking about free will, information, who owns thoughts, where do thoughts come from? Can you, how can you assign a dollar amount to something that, you know, maybe multiple people think at the same time, what's going to happen? That stuff is, is fascinating to me too. I mean, I, I regularly try to zoom out <clears throat> my perspective to, to think about that. And that's where the whole ethos with, with open source comes from. And we have to think of like, okay, what, what are we really doing here on this planet? You know, you, you have the more primal instincts saying, okay, you know, lock it down, make money, survive. And those are important instincts, <clears throat> but there, there's a way to balance that with, with also looking at what's happening on the planet with evolution, innovation, you know, we're all sitting here working on projects, sharing ideas, building software, creating content. And when you, when you lock down the conf- the content to such a degree or the, or the software or the hardware f- for that matter, to a point where, you know, others aren't able to build on top of it. You know, you sort of have to question what what you're really contributing to. I'm not I'm not sitting here judging people if they want to lock down certain things once in a while. I think that that's fine to do, but but balancing it out and you know giving away content, you know, not just in free as in free beer, but free as in freedom, like you know, put content into the public domain, you know, put it under a creative commons license once in a while. You don't have to do it with everything, but that gives, you know, for instance, this podcast, will people be able to, I, you know, you don't, I, I highly doubt you're the type who's going to go troll on copyright, but a lot of places do. So that if someone wanted to remix something from this podcast and then, you know, gets taken down from YouTube and that, that goes along with the whole censorship issue. 
we're by by doing that, you're disallowing innovation to occur, and you're 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 disallowing ideas to be built upon. And the same goes with software. So it's it's really damaging when people don't know about this. And zooming out further to like, okay, how does information actually work? Are these ideas that are coming out of our mouths right now actually our ideas in the first place to even have a right to to lock away? You know, that's more of a philosophical tangent on it, but it does matter because that's what sort of proves the the logic of of the whole idea of open sourcing what you do because if the way the universe works is that we're all sort of these filters for information that are putting together ideas in unique and interesting ways and you know putting our our own personal spin on it and you know building building onto it okay that's a lot different from me being you know, the original generator of the idea and actually having ownership over it in, you know, in a true sense. I don't know. Does, does that make sense? Oh, totally. And I, I feel like this, you know, consciousness is kind of expanding. And I don't know if that's in part due to the internet or maybe it's just like a part of nature, but. The internet is nature. The internet is absolutely. I mean, the internet is our ability to build on top of each other's ideas. I mean, whether or not people choose to lock down their content and put it on like, you know, strict copyright or proprietary software license, you know, the Chinese are just taking it anyway. It's like, you can try to restrict information, but it's not the information. There's the saying, you know, which is sort of cliche, but information wants to be free. Like, it's the information is going to find a way to route around these temporary facades of a blockade that humans try to put in place. So, you know, regardless of if you censor something or lock it down, the information is going to leak through. Now you just have to decide with your own content, your own creations, if you're going to, aid in the process of, of information being disseminated to everybody, or if you're going to, you know, and I think, you know, none of us are perfect. Like, I think we're going to all have, you know, some secrets and we're going to have stuff that we, that we freely share. So this isn't like a moral purity argument. It's more that we have to understand how the world works and it probably makes sense to, you know, share as much information as we can. Totally, man. It's, uh, it, it really, when you, you were talking about Elon Musk's, uh, neural link announcement and, you know, dude, I was thinking when you were just talking about what if, what if we could open source our brains? What if we could download thoughts? What if, what if we could edit thoughts? Like how far is this going to go? Do we want to go down that route? I don't think we have a choice. I think it's, it, it's, well, <clears throat> You know, not everybody's going to be required to take the, you know, neural link injection into their, you know, main vein. But there's already technology that can read your thoughts and it can visualize your thoughts on a screen. I mean, that's that's actually pretty old. That's like that's like a decade old and that, that we know of. So, you know, you can hook up and put, you know, different different hardware on your on your brain and it, it, it can read what's going on in your head. So it's, it's not going to stop. So do we want to maintain a, a distinction between our biology and our global consciousness, or should we just, you know, pick up our feet and go downstream and just, right. You know, tools are extensions of our biology. So like in nature, primitive humans would, you know, they'd pick up a stone and, you know, use it as, as an extension of themselves in order, in order to get things done. Or, you know, they would use their, their, their claws to, you know, hunt. Now we feel like technology is so different, but really, you know, the difference between an arrowhead stone and, you know, a laser weapon is really no different. It's just a matter of technological evolution. The point that I was trying to make is that, you know, look at what we're doing right now. We're, we're on these 
strange devices that are intercommunicating and we're broadcasting and we're recording and you know these the internet is this extension of ourselves so we we're we're clearly not wanting to just you know meet up in person and um well i think we would want to meet up in person but you know there's a reason that we're not just transcribing this on paper and like mailing a copy to every person that we can <laughs> yeah it's just it's, you know this is where things are going so we want though the tools to be pure so that the tools are not exploiting us and unfortunately the tools that we're using right now kind of are exploiting us um you know Google and, you know, various apps that we're using are probably not treating our data and whatnot in the best way. And so what we can do is make sure the tools are respecting us as much as, as they can and giving us access to their behavior so that, you know, there, there's a respectful relationship happening between us and our tools. I mean, if, if a caveman was using, you know, some tool that was like, you know, hurting it, it would probably stop using the tool, but we don't even really realize that they're hurting us because it's, it's so hidden. Yeah, man. It's like a, it's like a Python slowly squeezing us alive. And we're all like, like drug addicts. I think that's what you said. That's very appropriate. It is, it is, but it's also, you don't want to feel too much guilt. Like there's no reason for us to feel guilt about, you know, using some tools to help get this information out there. And over time we'll keep refining our tools and hopefully they'll be more ethical and treating us better. And cause you know, a lot of people can lose a lot of sleep over, you know, am am I on my my phone too much or like, you know, giving your, your friends too much shit over, over being on your phone too much. I mean, you know, we want to discipline ourselves. We should constantly be trying to improve that's the best that we can do. It's not worth ruining your day over the fact that you spent some time or maybe a little bit too much time online. As long as what you were doing, you feel good about. Yeah. I think that's important, man. And there's a lot of, you know, it's complicated being human and this is a complicated problem. Um, and I really appreciate your time today and breaking this, some of this down for us a little bit more. And, um, you know, I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about some of the new features coming out in minds, but hopefully in the future we can connect again. And, uh, Yeah, Bill, thanks so much for your time. It's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, Ethan. Really, really had fun talking to you.